want to say something, I want to guide the discussion in the following fashion. The, the first comment that I want to make is I'm very happy that the banks, uh, some members of the bank, and particularly the parliament, is here to take notes. Um, this is unfortunately not your opportunity to defend anything, it's your opportunity to, to hear what the people are saying about the processes that banks have <coughs> indicated uh, are happening uh, and whether or not, in fact, people will be contradicting what the banks have already said. I must also say the Bankers Association, Bank Bintu, uh, and a few of the other banks and legal practitioners have given us a substantive comment in writing. Uh, which we are currently considering uh, for how we will how we contribute to the reform process. So please um, take take notes as much as you can, and I'm hoping that actually this is a good opportunity for banks to maybe already start reforming their internal processes in an effort to try and see whether we can help some of our homeowners uh, keep their primary homes. So what I'm suggesting we do. Um, is that you you would raise your hand if you want to speak. I will not confine you to the specific issues that have been raised through our interrogation and our, our proposals. What I would like to hear uh, from homeowners in particular is uh, your general experience, uh, you know, in, in the processes that are set out uh, particularly by banks, you can indicate to us if you have any particular challenges and we'd be happy to listen to that. If you have any specific proposals towards the proposals that we've made, we are suggesting um, that you do that in writing, that you provide us, we will provide some information and a deadline uh, for specifically homeowners on, on the issues that have, that have come out of the discussion paper. So please feel free. Um, I just want to thank our Minister of Justice for opening up, opening up the floor to us and give us the opportunity um, for each and every European citizen to be part and parcel of, uh, of this event. And so we can lodge our complaints and to be heard as law abiding Namibian citizens and to try to find applicable solutions for the course of our Namibians that parts and parcel of our independence. And we would like to ask that our, that our voices will also be heard based on notes that we took and some decisions that we made. And we want the Office of the Ministry of Justice to look at what we're saying today as the homeowners and what we have been put through all these years in our struggle and uh, what difference can be brought to Namibia based on uh, how we as a community can work closely with the Minister of Justice and why uh, on the notes that I've got I just like to mention a couple of points and I won't get I won't move from the directions. But uh, before I come to any direction, and this is good, I just want to make myself clear. And I don't want to step on anybody's toes. The Norwegian institution in the body is that regulates the laws of the Norwegian banks should have been implemented subject to 1990 when our president was elected and promised the one we made ever came to light. I just want to thank the Honorable Minister of Justice as she is willing to, she and our office is willing to make to look at changes to assist communities in our struggle as our struggle became part and parcel of our independence as we look at unemployment, retirement, job losses and when we start looking at COVID-19, the epidemic and in general how it was being really impossible for the Libyans to make ends meet as yet the rates of the banks are very sky high. And as Article 87, that is certainly in the Constitution, that is said that we inherit some very different laws and it was never been amended. And that's why we are here today with the Ministry of Justice to look at these, to look at these challenges that we are facing 
and uh, see how we can broaden to see what changes we can make in the bench institution and to look at the challenges that the people have been facing. I was one of the uh, bank owners that went through some stuff. I will explain to it um, right now as I'm, as I'm going to the next uh, thing that uh, identifies the defects in the current administration framework. That we as the public ask the Minister of Justice that we cannot, we are part of your office to look at the laws that must be rewritten or must be scrapped because we cannot demand it. But we are looking at a law that suppressed the audience for a number of years. And based on this suppression, uh, our communities were suppressed by the South African laws that we needed to change due to our independence that we inherit and where our human, our human dignity was denied in many of these cases. I just want to go back and to look at when our Navigates came in front of the law of justice and they have no clue how to talk to any of the judges, how to behave. Our people are very scared of this specific, because this specific um, court system that we have because we need to look at the criminal on a different side and we look at home owners on a different side. We need to uh, take the two apart because we are looking at the interests of communities and based on the communities that was all these years as home owners and we look at the only sector that we are looking at today in our societies and about our communities that don't have homes, that we, the minority of the Libya prior to independence, was suppressed, and that was used against us. And we would like the Ministry of Justice to look at something we can't go back and two years what happened to, our, to, to us. But we can ask the Ministry of Justice to appoint a panel to look at 10 years back of all the houses that were to be repurchased by certain banks. And this panel must be overseen by ACC. That's what also is a very thing that we are looking at. We are trying to look at various options not to be grouped again by these mafia operations that was happening in Olympia. And um, we want the Ministry of Justice to look at the 10 years. Look how the people from 10 years can be assisted through the right to appoint the right channel because the legal aid system is really doesn't work. Then I know for a fact because I dealt with them already. So I am glad that I'm here to get the Minister of Justice to give my complaints and so to be heard. I go to the next question. It was based in an article 11 February 2022. The own words. I have emphasized the Constitution as a supreme law and a living document which must be internationalized by each and every citizen in pursuit of full enjoyment of their rights and for the betterment of social cohesion and nation building. Thus, we exercise our rights, we should always do it in furtherance of the right of fellow citizens in order to consolidate peace, unity and stability. These factors give us the opportunity that this was actually being set and we must take note of the proposal at hand for the community of the Libya and the tenure period that we ask and the help that we ask because the pool was being made more poor according to the law that was still not being revised. And uh, I thank the Minister of Justice and everybody to that they will amend this and look at the certain things that we ask as community members. But I would also like to explain my experience with the, with the current bank system. At my house on 26 March 2021, a judgment was issued by the court. Law in order to sell the house in June 2021. I fell behind with six months payment. And uh, the bank came back with my arrears. The bank told me my arrears 
or 240,425. So I have somebody in Cape Town look at my, my document because I know I'm only six months behind and I know what my current uh, payment is at the banks. So I just want you to look at the bank systems, how we feel the media as bank of the Libya. I need to be continue, need to have control over these banks. Um, according to my home loan, it was 240,000. I want the community out there to listen to that because many of them will come out now and will be hurt from what we are talking about. My house loan actually was insinuated by the bank. I'm actually 24 months behind. So this bank actually has many grades to many of them, as what he said. But it was wrong. I paid. 42,000 to be on the online date. I pay an extra 6,000 to be until the end of June 2021. These men have been so far again and get a judgment on 1st of July 2021 again against me, which I stop them and ask them to not give me the merits how did they come around that I was one day behind and the judgment was a big issue. And that's why I ask the Ministry of Justice that we as a Republican citizens and the suppression that we went through was being abused by a system of banks. And that's why I ask the Ministry of Justice to look at 10 years way back of these certain banks and the wrongs they done with a lack of knowledge our Republican citizens have. They did lose their properties. They, lose, they did lose what they built for 17 years, and what the banks are, and what we ask today, that we ask that we look at certain policies and things that needs also, also need to be revised. We look at how can the bank that you may be oh maybe 200,000 and your house is valued for for three or two million, sell the house for 300,000. Get their people involved, they buy the house because nobody said the auction is there. Your house has been sold for 200,000 and they lost up for 1.8 million. How transparent was our law system in this? How transparent was the development laws that are a body to regulate these certain banks? I thank you. The group that is not comfortable with English. English is the official language, but if you're not comfortable with English, just indicate to us if you want to express yourselves in your mother tongue so that we find a way of summarizing uh, what you're saying in English. So, is there anyone else that wants to speak at this point? Yes, Mr. Summers? Yes, uh, his name is Mr. Fish. Um, his wife passed away in 2012. They, the two of them had a bank loan together. And uh, just to be very short and sweet, also, this, the case was already in court where the bank interdicted him and his wife uh, based on the home loan that they did have. And what happened to you in the court document, he says that the bank is asking for uh, that he, uh, Ms. Mrs. Priest and Mrs. Priest had a loan in 2014 being taken out. Um, Mrs. Fee signed in 2012. Uh, I just want to show you that how the bank system failed the bank. And uh, this I have the court documents and how the courts, because of the lack of knowledge that we don't have, cannot assist the communities. And that's why we ask for you, the Minister of Justice, is there a panel which we can help us for the community, for, for the Indian community? Thank you. And I'm speaking for BLNN, Black Business Leadership Network. And I'm coming as the leader of food. Now, happy independence. Happy celebration of independence. So we are no longer in the apartment anymore. But I want to inform you, we are officially being drawn in the apartment legislation. Minister of Justice, the legal drafting and the legal reform haven't been doing the work. That's the first point. Second point is that we have a wonderful constitution. We have the articles that are there, but they are not in line with the old legislation that are in place. We can talk about this document. I went through. 
But the laws are not in our faith. It's Namibians. <coughs> so yeah, in Namibia. Our courts, our bourgeoisie courts, are for the regions. Let's just be honest about it. You know? Our courts are not tailored for poor people, for impoverished people. You know, if you have a mother and father, we are coming from the background where our mothers were cleaners, gardeners. There is no way in this 32 years you can find, identify me one black industrial list a billionaire under this laws. You can have a house, you can have a car, you can talk about the banks, but the law is not our thing. Whether it's the magistrate, if you look at long and hard, the magistrate's rules and the acts are not in our favor. It's a 1953-1944. You can talk about use of the acts of these mortgage bonds. The banks are operating under the law. You can talk about credit agreement acts. You look at that legislation, which is still in place, they are not in, in line with the constitution. You can talk about blacklisting. <coughs> All those laws that we have, Minister of Justice, are not in favor in line with our constitution. So then come to the legal question, as we know. Even if we are talking about the banks, the bank will tell you these are the laws in place and we are going according to that law. Finish the start. So this discussion of saying the banks, the banks are commercial banks, they are there to make money. Period. And even if you are negotiating with the bank, you are there. The problem is there is an overhaul of these laws in our court system. The judicial officers that are executing the law, and we can't blame them, but we need to change the law so that we have a level ground. We don't have a level ground, Mr. Justice. Let's tell the truth. Look at the credit agreement act. I was looking at these laws. If you look at the Use of Act and the South Africans, where the laws are coming from, have changed. So we are in the darkness and claiming freedom, freedom, 32 years. But we are not, we, there is no law in favor of you. There is no law when, when, you, when you go for mortgage bond for 35 years and then you default for three months and your house gets auctioned and it beaten and you are out there. And your 22 months or 20 years or 15 years is down the drain. That is the reality of the whole thing. So I'm unapologetic black. I'm not blaming colors here. But I'm saying there is no way a black child can own property in Namibia. There is no way. And let's just be honest, it has become so difficult, Minister of Justice, that our mothers used to live in a four-bedroom house, two-bedroom house, which they need. Those houses, when, when uh, Dr. Libertine was the minister, he gave an offer to buy those houses for 150. Today, those houses, and municipality can also come in, they are worth of 802 million in Katuduna, where the toilet is outside. Because the laws are not in favor of the Namibians. So the starting point that I suggest is that let's go back to those laws. Let the law drafting and legal drafting do the research and your public hearings. And not attacking the bank. Let the judicial officer who are executing go sell the house, evict the house. Those things are in line with the, with the, with the laws that are there. They all are public laws. And if we are saying the banks, the banks are there to make money and they have got laws that are protecting them because those laws haven't changed. So, us as an organization, BNN, we are saying let's go back to our mission and our vision is that let's sit down and have public hearing and talk about these laws. People are losing property. It was economy recess, it was the COVID, it was drought, and then if you can't make money and you are locked down, how are you going to pay your, your, your installment for the house or the car? How do you own property in, in, in the 32 years? Maybe those ones. I have heard you say, I just came in now because I was late. But there's no way, there's no law protecting you. You can go to the bank, the bank charges, the collection fees, the lawyer's fees. We got CEO, the Descot Company, Secretary, legal officers. They will hand you over to a private lawyer and not them dealing with a letter of demand and someone which is a simple letter to write, which is a simple arrangement that they can call you. There is a banker and a, a client relationship in terms of the corporate law. We all know that. Do they exercise the relationship with you? Do, are they holding in new costs? Are the banks in Namibia, I'm talking about the banks, including the governor of Bank of Namibia, are they really interested that Namibia should not lose property? 
This land of the brave. Let's look at the laws and that's what I'm saying. Some of the issues that is calling us not only to action but also calling us out. Yeah. We will take responsibility for where we have had lapses, uh, but we will also share with the public uh, some of the actions we've taken to address those concerns. But I think um, the, the Shanika is making a, a very emphatic case for how laws are hampering uh, development and starting development uh, in the Middle East. So thank you very much. Um, Good morning once again. Um, my name is Simon. I'm um, the chairperson of the Black Business Leadership Network of Namibia. And uh, yeah, Ms. Shaniga, you have spoken. Um, however, th there are a few things that we need to be real with as, as homeowners and also as, uh, as business people. Now, it's very easy to lie through a a documented and a drafted letter. Uh, for, for those who are very much literate, you know that if I build my house, you can't need laws in my house. That's a fact. It is my house. So I'm, I'm alluding to Bank of Namibia and how much control they want to tell the Namibian public that they have over commercial banks. Okay? And also that we know we have act, act in our banking uh, policies that are as old as uh, 30 years, no, 40 years. A banking law which is older than 40 years. And it's running and rolling over a young republic being private or uh, being commercial. Now, I, I want to be quick on some realities. It was said by the World Bank, 1.6 million people live under the poverty line in the Republic of Namibia, and currently we have a 44% of unemployment rate. Now, we need to go, we need to backtrack quickly and see whether there's reality in what we are all trying to address here. There are three pillars to consider why the Ministry of Justice may be in the hot seat in our discussion at this, at this point in time. How much employment was created before independence? How much Employment was created before independence, and how much employment was created after independence? How much employment was lost, as my colleague they said? Okay? How much industries did our government create after independence? To complement the value addition of home ownership, not just looking at the law reform that we intend to seek. How many jobs were lost in the last 40 years? Now, there's one painful thing that I want to bring to your attention, Honorable Minister of Justice, that there's a location in Katipura called Police Camp. And they have a neighbor location called, I think, Damarasieve, Damarases, and also Geniente. These houses are maturing to the age of 60. 60. Now, if you go into the neighborhood, the house is now in a third generation, and they are still paying for it. <laughs> it doesn't really make ample sense that a house has been paid for 60 years. We must also backtrack to find out what happened to Swabo. Where is Swabo? Where is Swabo today? Because Swabo in Namibia was the pot where we invested. What happened to Swabo? Swabo was hijacked by FNB. With no public audience like this, or consent or consultation, lawyers, 
lawyers and the scandalists to defraud and impoverish people in this country. It's, it's, I don't see how, how, it, how it's not possible. If a person can pay what they are able to pay on their home loan, why should there be a third party to induce that person to pay the little they can pay? The word debt means your ability to pay. I have cases in my office where a single mother of three kids owes, she's in arrears of 150,000, Honorable Minister, is documented. I have proofs on the same pen. 150, her total bond is 550,000. She's asked by the same bank to pay 5,450. She can't afford it. She just got re-employment now. However, the same lady can afford three thousand Namibian dollars. They are going to auction her house in three weeks' time. They say no to three thousand dollars. There's a bank in the Republic of Namibia. It's saying buy a brick, contribute to buying a brick for one dollar, I think, or two dollar, and let's build homes. The same bank, I have three cases where this same bank is auctioning people's houses. What a contradictory in openness. Now, when you, when you sell somebody's house or repossession of foreclosure on property, I don't think you are teaching somebody manners. I don't think you are teaching somebody manners. I don't think you are educating anybody. And we should not lie to the masses seated here. We don't have control over the policies and the system that regulate banks in this country. This should become a fact. We don't have that. Honorable Minister, we don't have that. We are dealing with policy research for the last six months since we went public, and we have realized banks are like um, scavengers prowling on defenseless members of public. It's unfortunate, it's unfortunate that my name is Eliphas, my same name is Simon, but to, to, to smell and look relevant. I can only say Eliphaz Simon Namibia, and then I look uh, prevalent and relevant. These such practices in Namibia, we are also going to research them and bring them to light. The unemployment rate in this country is very high. The land issue, the land issue, which is not being dealt with in this country, is also a contributing factor to homelessness and it should also be addressed. The high return unit, let's look at Enamitia. How many people have lost their jobs within Enamitia? And how many of those people now, banks are going to run after? <laughs> are we for real in this world? How many people? Now, let's look at what's about to happen in Transnami. How many people are going to lose their jobs? And how many of those people will be chased by banks? Honorable Minister, there's abuse in courts, especially when it comes to Rule 108. Banks and the court are in intermarriage to abuse, and you said it, Honorable Minister, in your opening remarks, to humiliate homeowners in this country. We are a small republic. We can turn this republic in a Dubai in, in few months. We have all the wealth and the assets. However, the colonial impunity and rules and policies that are underlying, especially through banks, are making that dream and that reality. Vision 2030 and even near, 
are one of the undermined uh, policies in place from government that are not being given a doorway in, in order for these policies to come into existence or to be employed or to be implemented. We have adopted the policy of national reconciliation and we are going to refuse to inherit those underlying uh, statutory laws that are bringing our people to their knees. Uh, we, 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 we have also seen uh, that the issue of banks buying homes is a tactic employment between the lawyers, the legal people within the same bank, and individuals and courts to sell certain properties within a certain short period of time. How do you sell a defaulter's house in six months? Even three months. Honorable uh, Minister, my office has proof to the, I can call it allegations, or to the statement you have made. I have it proof on black and white. I'm dealing with cases from the banks on a daily basis. And at the moment, we are defending close to seven repossessions that are illegal. And banks know that. Telecom, I will mention you on record. We are coming after you for inflated loans that were given to individuals whose houses now are un unpaid, but money went on their accounts. And let us revisit the past just before independence. While your office, Honorable Minister, our founding was able to release prisoners. Prisoners were pardoned. Do you remember, guys? They went home. Do you remember, guys? Why couldn't the Office of the Justice uh, Ministry, she was not the person in the office, why could they not re-look at the home loans of 1988, right? To the eve of independence that they would be scrapped if there was so much mercy. To do what? To alleviate uh, a sense of uh, belonging and, and democracy. Without a home or land, you are nobody in the Republic of Namibia, and nobody will listen to you. 95% of our land is owned by foreigners who reside outside this country. Some of them are not paying taxes. Enough is enough, and our organization is out there like a dog and like an eagle to make sure that none of you seated here should lose a home. We want our children to have generational wealth and inheritance. I thank you. Valuable inputs. This is the idea with this uh, consultation is to get information that we may not be aware of as the ministry specifically, but also uh, to start to hear what are some of the reforms that we would like to see. Many of it may not be within the purview of the Ministry of Justice directly, because various ministries represent various sectors, and we hope that some of that information that we are getting from this platform today we can share with our respective ministries. But you're making a valuable point, and I don't want to make a judgment on the rightness or wrongness of any of the information that is being shared here. The only correction that I want to say, as a member of the executive, I am not at liberty and I have, I have always been a defender of the independence and the impartiality of the judiciary uh, in this country. And uh, the comments I've made specifically are comments that I'm aware of <coughs> when I was in practice about how some legal practitioners, particularly those that are in debt collection, treat uh, debtors um, and this from that knowledge and some of it actually was also shared with our office about the kind of abuse and humiliation that people go through. And I think we don't have to have that kind of conduct, even as legal practitioners or debt collectors, to, to, to put people who are already in a distressing situation uh, through your behavior to make them feel um, even and I stand by it, but it did not involve the court system. Yes, 
My name is Einhard Schröder. I'm sitting with the fake title deed that was issued from the Minister of Land and Reforms. I've opened a criminal case against a criminal. I'm still waiting. Uh, the fake document is for the CC. It is not behind the student. What can I do? I give it to a legal practitioner to look if it's right or it's wrong. When I get it, what can I do with that document? That's all I want to do. I will, I will, I will bring it back. Where, what can I do with that document when I get it? That's all. Thank you. We've taken note of your, your question. We will forward it to the relevant institution. All protocols observed. And thanks for the opportunity here. Um, Madam Minister, if I were to contribute one thing to this discussion, it would be to try and infuse a human rights element to our discussion. Why do I say so? I say so because I would want us to start at the very beginning, and that is to recognize that the right to adequate housing is recognized under international law and under the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which the Namibian government has signed and ratified. So in terms of Article 144, of our constitution, the right to adequate housing is very much part and parcel and has been incorporated to that article in our legal system. Having said that, the right to adequate housing, the first element of the right to adequate housing is the right to security of tenure. And the discussion here centers around so the issue of security of tenure. And that is that homeowners has the right to security of tenure and that government must protect that through laws. And this is where I want to congratulate you and your team for the effort that you're making. How best can we as a government, your government, protect the right of security of tenure of homeowners. I'll make later a point, but that's not really what I want to address. Security of tenure is not really only the issue that relates to homeowners. In passing, but that's really not my point, in passing, security of tenure is also very much applicable to people that are renting. The 2016 Intercentral Survey indicated that much more people are renting in Namibia than that they are homeowners. So the security of tenure issue is not really just concerns the issue of homeowners. And if we even go and desegregate uh, those that are renting, the, the 2016 Intercentral Survey further goes down, if you break it down, the majority of those that are renting are actually living in informal settlements. And these are the people that are suffering severe forms of insecure tenure. But as I said, this is not the platform. I just want to throw that. So there's indeed also need for law reform and the issue of rent control, which is obviously not a discussion here, is really an issue that must be addressed. But coming back to what I want to say, I have a cursory reading of the proposals that you've made. Unfortunately, I only got it now. But uh, it's a step in the right direction. But with all due respect, in my opinion, it starts at the wrong end. It starts at where the process is in the courts. And that is wrong. That is cosmetic. Maybe, not even maybe, the beginning would be to have the right to secure the right to adequate housing and trends in a, a piece of legislation. And that piece of legislation must do two things, in my opinion. One, 
it must give explicit recognition to the right to end the housing. And then secondly, it must charge those institutions that are responsible for housing with the obligation to facilitate the right to adequate housing. We've got an institution like the NHC, for example, and I've checked the, the certificate that my, my, my PC went off. We've got an institution like the NHC that says if someone defaults, the NHC as an institution has the right to institute within 30 days execution procedures. So here we've got the High Court rules that, that you, we are trying to amend and say that try and make it difficult for a house to be auctioned, but you've got the law that makes it even easy for them to run to the court. And so my, my, that's my point. My point is maybe the nice um, procedural guidelines and safeguards which the High Court rules are introducing at that level, maybe it should be built in, into acts like the NSC Act. So as to make the courts the last resort. Secondly, and here, the lady spoke about the very nice examples that we can draw from South Africa. That your proposal is saying there's a problem of people not understanding court processes, there's a problem of uh, justice being expensive, and my proposal therefore is in, in, in building on the issue that courts should be the last resort, why don't we do like South Africa? Why do we do like the UK? Why don't we do like Australia, where they have what they call a housing ombuds? What is the meaning of a housing ombuds? Where there are issues dealing with uh, housing disputes, instead of running at a court by, as a case of uh, first instance to the courts, by law, there's an institution that you go to that deals with your issue of default, for example, and see what we can do outside the court system. So that would be my tangible re recommendation. And coming back to what I said, um, what we are doing, with all due respect, is trying to put a bandage over a, a wound and not go to the core of the problem. The core of the problem, three, as I said, recognized by law the right to adequate housing in, uh, as I said, in our laws. Secondly, oblige our institutions to facilitate instead of, of uh, jeopardizing the right to adequate housing. And thirdly, let's have accountability mechanisms built into our laws so as to ensure that the courts are just there to, to supplement what could have been done or what was not done at the local level. I think with that, I've said what I want, wanted to say. Right. Now, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, and I agree with you that the, the, it was a reaction to what was going on in, in the moment. Uh, and I think sometimes, you know, you, you, if, even if you consider an immediate reaction uh, to a situation, sometimes that is yes. the immediate solution that you want to have. Um, what would you, because you imagine, uh, John, that these kinds of issues actually take quite a bit of time. You know, because there's, there's quite a bit of background work that needs to happen. The kind of research that I see um, the black business people are now undertaking, I'm sure uh, as part of your scholarly work, you've done quite a bit of work in, in the right to housing and so forth. Two questions that I have. The one is, when you say uh, accountability institutions, what does that look like? And then also, um, shouldn't, you know, would you agree with me if I say, that, you know, they, they, 
we, we can actually have a two-pronged approach. In other words, you don't have to wait for the one to finish in order to start the other one. So these two can actually run uh, parallel. Would you agree with me? Uh, and, and, and what would your suggestion in, in this instance be? Um, that, you know, what, what, what do you think are the key things, immediate things that we can already do to start any of the processes that you think um, would be appropriate in this instance? Thank you. Why can't we put a moratorium on the execution of housing? That is possible because Article 18, no, no, first of all, Article 5 of the Constitution says that the obligation to respect human rights applies both vertically and horizontally. We should not have the idea that banks can just do what they want because the common law says that the creditor, I mean, what, what, what is that? Uh, uh, Maximum of the, the creditor, the creditor takes it all, something like that. That should not be the case. Not in a, in, a, in a milieu or an environment where we have the constitution that says and says juristic persons like banks must respect the right to adequate housing. So they can't act as if they have iron on them, uh, onto themselves. So that's what I said. A, an immediate um, moratorium, I would say. And then while this process is on, a, an extensive audit of laws that impedes the right to adequate housing as opposed to facilitate the enjoyment thereof. That's what I would say. The execution of someone's house without any administrative uh, oversight within. Article 18 says, whatever decision you are taking, must be lawful, must be fair, and must be reasonable. So that is the accountability mechanism that we say must be built into the institution to give the person that is in default the opportunity to come and state his case and to try and make up the case for not to execute his or her house at, at the public auction or whatever. And this is uh, what I'm trying to say some of the accountability measures that must be built into the law. And yes, they may say, yeah, but John, we do have these administrative practices. Your administrative practice, yes, is good, but it is not written down. And it is only known to you. But if it is written down, then everyone that is affected by this would know and have legal certainty in terms of what needs to be happening in a situation like this. I hope I've answered your question. My name is Alyssa Skaya. Great to everybody. Sorry. And I thank Minister to allow me to start and start with my own language. Okay. I mean, you know, you wish I had a good thing, I'm going to be. And I wish I had a good thing, I'm going to be. 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 We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. We have to do the money to buy it. She has to give it, she has to go with it. When I was so glad that I had a touch for interest, I gave up the only interest that I don't know if it's that people will wish you. Oh, no, 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 so I don't have to go home to the garage to go to the house. I don't have to go home. But if you go home, if you go home, you know what you're saying. 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 Mundo eu vou dizer não já li, se o ato de hoje mandar já mato tanto do projeto, mas não, o ato de hoje não se mandar já o batido também não. 
kidi tulimo de Kwa sababu cha mwenye kwa na mimi ndio kama tuwayune tulimo de Nomba sana kwa hii shubala hii kuna ngoga ndio nyumba cha nei na kuna hiyo ringi sana kwa sababu cha mechi sio meka ngile na kalama na chi Mtu kuna mtu kumetu bu kumetu badere kumetu pomu yero nguri wo tiende tuka ngile mwa nini no matereta no mechi ni yobi bitu to shimara cho pina ndo 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 Dangi, the property is the informal settlement. Like I asked, let's say maybe we we'll still yeah. the land or after land, yeah. the land, yeah. the land. Yeah. So um, she bought this property. Uh, what she bought this property, I think, through a municipality scheme also. Um, so she's saying that uh, what happens is that she has to pay a monthly installment towards that property. But sometimes she's not able to do it because of her which is a single woman who has kids and um, the amount of salary or the any amount of money that she gets sometimes is not enough to cater for the household needs as well as to pay for the property. So she will probably maybe default a month or two. And then she's saying that she has owned this property for a very long time. But then what happens is the interest rate for those months that she has not uh, paid to that she has defaulted, the interest is so high that it ends up that she pays the property for a very long period because of this interest. What happens is that the municipality will then hand over, hand over to debt collectors, who then also put all their charges and their interest. And then, so she's now paying for this property for the longest time, where she feels that she should have been able to to be, to be, she should have been able to be finished by paying the property by now. But because of all these interests, the municipality interest, and then the debt collective interest and their charges, she ends, she's ending up paying for the property for a very long period. Um, she's saying also because if the municipality or could the DDB have a provision whereby she, they could, she could go and make an arrangement like, see, I cannot afford um, the unified hundred, I can only afford two hundred for a certain period of time. It would be easier for her because I mean she's a mother and she has to also take care of her kids. But then the municipality they don't even have any uh, sort of consultation. They just hand her over to the um, to the debt collectors without any consultation, and then this interest or obviously increase. So she's saying that she's very thankful for this opportunity to express herself and to also to, to tell the leaders of what is really going on and how they are suffering, especially in the informal settlements with this type of arrangement. Uh, what she says, which is... It's like it's too much. No, I think that the end of the is also very strong. What she's saying, Minister, is that she has contract in the 2007 where the municipality has what they call a self help in through leasing agreement. So you lease for a period of time, and through the period of time, you must be able to finish that amount that you give it to them. She's saying she, has, she knows that she has already finished paying, even though in between there she could default it, but she's drawn into interest and the handover charges. And the amount that she's paying, knowing that she has already finished paying, is not the amount of the principal debt. It's the amount of interest that continue as the mother is having the property and she's still drawn deeper in the debt because of the interest and charges that are overcoming to her. She was happy that this forum is providing for her so that it can address to those issues. Honorable Minister, you asked for practical suggestions. And I'm also very happy that John put it up that you have to settle the laws from the right, you know, starting point. And I think that banking institutions have always had an obvious opportunity to form and formulate and influence laws. And I think our government has been hearing and being lobbied by a lot of people very much. But actually, the, the duty is to protect our society and move our society forward in line with your manifesto of the party which was elected into power, which would be actually serving the people and protecting the people.
um, exploitation, etc. And we wanted to practice the experiences. And John mentioned that not only house ownership, but renting schemes, uh, systems, also to say that to be considered. Practical experience. Home landlords are allowed to charge inflation, increases rent. In other countries, it's, it's limited. I got, I was a home where I was renting. I got ten percent of my contract, my pro, and they don't even have the decency. The interest they get on my, what they call the deposit, is actually mine. They keep it. It's illegal because it's actually my interest. They make more money on a deposit I make. Why don't you just three percent increase, whatever? They, they must be related to something inflation, etc. But they must be justified. You can't just increase them the year by ten percent. I started renting somewhere five thousand. I ended up to a little over ten thousand, which was then more. But a, 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 a healthy ratio of rent pay is one third of your salary. I paid them way beyond uh, which, uh, half of my salary for rent, but I started with a quite good ratio of one third. That is not okay. You can just make a law. Tax table off three percent limited. You can even uh, you can skyrocket. You can even kind of seal. The amount of rent in totality that's discussed all over the world, the cities of Berlin, for the people, etc., when there's a system implemented. It's challenged by the Supreme Court or the Supreme Court, Supreme Court, Supreme Court Day, but it's possible. And it actually would be in line with your, your party's manifesto. That's why I'm saying, please, I, I'm not a member of your party or anything, but you represent that and you represent the manifesto. Please implement it. Thank you. Did I get your own? Tiswako Twenty-eight <laughs> This is era of the money. This is a twenty October October in a legal after the Sigma. Did I get a detachment? I'm Matiko legal after the Sigma. Adam Madi Mahasi Ramadi. Uriba, so, she gets a Nava, old Maggie. Maggie. She gave Nava Hava Agribanza, Ige Ferbans is a registered Chis Sako Vital, Yugo Sako de Bakuwa, Ige seeking up or what is a cock me. Oske Evan is a game a keta. What I get to take Aromas, Evan Bisa, Missa, Petal is the Maria Sunhawa, Osta Petale, or at Hava Kisa. Sita can let it, Missa, Neta Maran Wow, Oske et twenty eight in a who. Ari Ari Guesa affection donut, a fire donut, Seguesa, Ske Evan Bisa, Mapro Badis, Kiaske, Bar, Portea, Maisa, Agribanks, Ha Ari Ama Oceans, 
時代劇の悪魔ダーコンスやるといくいかあるとこはいくだけだからなおせんと感じです Uh, to investigate what has transpired.、Um, he is saying he, he was a successful、uh, farmer,、uh, and then when the drought hit, he, he was actually he, he realized that he was going to have some challenges with his accounts, many of them that he had with FNB. So he started taking steps, selling off some of、um, his,、uh, what are they called? Livestock. Livestock. <laughs> Thank you.、Um, he started selling off his livestock, and, and between, for in a short space of time, he paid into FNB's account half a million, almost half a million, about 500,000 or so. And, and the idea was he did not want to default because up to that point, when the drought hit, and, and up to 2018, he was actually a diligent. Uh, paid up member of FNB at the time, and he didn't want to lose that. And as part of those arrangements, what he did is, apart from paying in every penny that he was making from selling the bank, because he was a farmer, and Akibank agreed to take over one loan. The one he, he's also informing us that yesterday, actually, that、uh, land was sold by FNB, as opposed to recover. Some of the debt、um, that he has accumulated since October 2018. But what he says, which is of significance, is until October 2018, he had taken steps to mitigate、um, the impact that he, the drought would have on him not being able to pay. Something、uh, that in the banking circles is called opportunity for arrangements、uh, that he was making. Other bankers actually. Uh, written him what appeared to have been a guarantee for over 400,000. And what they were willing to take over、uh, was the land that was sold yesterday. At the time, it was worth, he owed them about 200,000. So that would have settled that particular amount, and it would then, he would have had something left to, to take care of, to consolidate some of the other debts that he had, I suppose, particularly with FNB, because he had no debts. Um, at the time, apart from the debts he had in respect of the FNB. His, his discontent and disappointment and hurt and pain is that during all of the time that he started communicating with FNB, and he has shown our office、uh, some proof of people receiving the information、um, at FNB specifically,、uh, he says he had then、um, they did not communicate with. All, all of that time until he started to default. And when he started to default, he says there was no communication with him. He was simply referred to、uh, the legal department. In the meantime, he also went, he was advised to maybe approach the Bank of Namibia.、Um, he's also disappointed because the Bank of Namibia also did not come through for him. There is a complaints department, but the Bank of Namibia apparently advised him. That they, there was nothing that they could do if, if FNB at that time was taking the steps that they were taking. The point really、uh, that he makes is that he has、uh, lost, the, he's lost his livelihood basically. I think he had to take his child out of school from university.、Um, he has lost some of his movable properties、uh, to try and settle some of those debts. And, and he has basically lost his livelihood. You know, he has now、uh, still a primary home, but the, the, the land that he lost yesterday was linked in many ways to his primary、uh, property, and he's obviously anxious about what, what, what is next, you know, if he doesn't get the kind of assistance that he's looking for. So,、uh, part of why we are consulting today is. To really hear some of these stories. Because we've heard the bank's version、uh, when we consulted with them, and they have put some of their versions also in writing. And this is homeowners,、um, and something important that、uh, John also raised about people who rent is to hear the stories of what is going on. Because we do want to take these documents and go back to, to, to the banks 
um, to the financial institutions to see what what can we do differently, you know, to mitigate the impact um, that some of these actions have on the lives of our people. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kanasib, and I'm happy that some of the other banks are in the house to hear uh, what people's experience, lived experiences are. Not things that are on paper, not things that we only hear in courtrooms, but people's lived experiences about their interactions um, with, with particularly our commercial banks in the country at the moment. So thank you very much, Mr. Kanasib, for that. But I'm sure I'll, I'll give you a floor in a minute. But I have three things that I want to mention to the question, what, what is the monitoring that we need to put on? Now, during my reign as a magistrate, as a civil magistrate, is that people do not know. By the issue of the summons at the magistrate court, there is a list clerk there that are already shortlisted. You are not lost shortlisting after the judgment. You are actually shortlisting by a summon being presented at the magistrate court. And we need to understand. It's very serious. And our own clerk, the government clerk, are actually commissioned by those legal practitioners to start noting your blacklist by a summons. Mm. You see, that's how unjust the summon process is. So you are not shortlisted after the judgment. And we can go to a legislation in particular magistrate court at the high court and you see what I'm talking about. Number two, Comrade Minister, who think what must be done now is that can the Minister of Security, the police officer, and the division, where in law are they actually uh, legitimized to come and meet people? You have police officers that are coming to evict you from your house and your children, and it's very fortunate exercise. The army of Namibia and the police are there so that they can throw you out. And they close. I have a case of Master, Master Hope, you can just say that. There, where the police literally have to remove him out of a corporate case. And they have to guard the place there because it's a rate of execution. So we want also the message and say, the police has other way to do it. We, want, we don't want police to be present by the one forcing people because they are reminding us in the old legislation. We are coming to the law when a black person was owing, he must go and send a sentence to jail. Yeah, this is how the law was. So that memory of the presence of the police at the institution or at the eviction is drawing us back where we have come from. We are coming from that era. We were in jail. Our parents or whatever when they go, they will go to jail and send a sentence. Okay? The second aspect that I want to deal with is with the banks. Now let me just give an example that the gentleman actually brought me there. If I'm only five million and I pay the three, the three quarter of the debts, when that property is sold, which is mostly sold three times than what you owe, why is there no change? What do you want? But who can change present? Plain health. What can declare plain health many people? That does it, the other thing is a very serious one because the bank does not even come and report back and say we have sold your property, we have got our money that we were looking for, and, and the rest of the money that we got, here is your money. Or here is the change. They don't bring the change. And that's what we want to see from the bank. Okay. The second aspect that I want to deal with is the messenger of the court. I'm saying, but I want to address the message of the court. The message of the court, we need to deal with the message of the court. With all due respect, I just think the court, the judiciary, need to deal with the message of the court. We are busy in reaching the message of the court, and the message that charges, we don't know under what regulation they are regulated or under what law. Because when you go and see how your property is sold, about 60% of that amount that is evicted. It goes to the message of the court. And you can't question it. The messenger of the court from the high court taking a judgment to where we are here, or let Katitura, is charging exorbitant charges that we don't know. The messenger will charge you a thousand dollars, two thousand, three thousand for delivering that judgment to you. So we also need to look at the messenger of the high court and the messenger of the court. Those charges must be regulated. We don't know where they are getting the charges from. 
Because if I'm driving my car from the high court to Temple Jail, or for example in Tukatutura, how many kilos is it? And how is those charges regulated? And I believe the messenger is appointed by the Minister of Justice. I'm checking the law. So please correct me. Why is the messenger of the court, it was the father, then the son, then the grandson? Are we not having black Namibia that can be black messenger of the court in this country? No, I, I want to be blind. I want to be very, I'm not apologizing to this. Okay? The, the second aspect that I want to deal with, and we have got all these people. I can tell you there is horrors when you are high court, what they call motion court. It's also time to see what our young lawyers are doing. Yeah, you want to be rich, but let me tell you, you have made the wrong movement to come and study law because law is a noble profession. You don't get rich when you are a lawyer. You serve the community. So things that they are doing and things that are presenting in the motion court, it's also time to become supervising. What are they busy doing in the motion court? Do they get, are they following the procedure the way it is? Or are they just taking hostage to everything? We are under siege when it comes to the civil procedures. We are under siege to know what is happening with our lives, our children's lives, like the gentleman is saying, I'm also a victim. When her kids don't have school, she doesn't have a house, doesn't have a farm, the life is gone. But let us Namibia stand up. Because we are voters. We vote people in the offices. So, Minister, I respect, but our court is not also a case. When you come there with a default judgment, the court is asking you, but where is your lawyer? Your house is taken. Then the lawyer is telling you to go to the high court and to defend the matter. Put the 30,000 on. Remember you are dead already. Legal aid minister is also one of the oversaturated legal aid has got only three lawyers. Civil lawyers that are dealing with civil matter in this whole country. I'm sorry to tell you that. The forms are there in legal aid. To launch your form to legal aid and say help me is not a problem. To get the right lawyer to defend your matter promptly because the time is running at the court. The court has not your time. When the court issues a default judgment, within a specific time you must defend it, you don't defend it, you are dead cow. And these are the things that we are saying, what monitoring should we put in? We are not saying the court must relate and they are not doing their job. But how, how do you come in to defend your meta time? It's also a problem. How do you get the 30,000 or 40,000 and 30,000? Please defend me. How does legal aid, I don't blame legal aid, because legal aid is a problem. It's outsourcing that legal aid act or must also be act. The church minister, and I, I don't want to, that is not a legal aid matter. But the, the check and balances, there are serious check and balances with our act of legal aid that must come in. You come to Lea Shanika, legal practitioner, but Lea Shanika is not the one doing the case. Lea Shanika is giving it to the candidate legal practitioner who's trying to figure out how to do this case. And when this legal practitioner or any legal practitioner can figure out what is the legal issue, then they say no, there is no case for you. So there is also in our system as we speak, I see the law commission and everything, that we need to take, we need to take control. There are laws, like I said, but there are also the practicing and the execution of the, the, the laws are the problem. So there are many things, and my, my plea is that we cannot have the message of the court in the old dispensation. What type of qualification is this message of the court given? That we can't hear. Alex Marquez. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Shamika. Uh, you see, English is a very tricky language. You know? And it always sounds true, even it's lying. Now, what I want to say is that we have adopted laws or laws that we are galloping with. You know, galloping with some, some support. But we never questioned these laws. One of them is the activity of the message of the court. Yeah. I want to mention the following thing. If a defaulter, an account holder with municipality, cannot pay their water bill. A small committee within municipality came together, they gave birth 
to reinforce. But the red force is entitled to take a certain portion of the money being paid by a deep holder to the city of Bundu from the account of the city of Bundu in the new Republic of Namibia. If the person really don't have money to pay city of Bundu, why should they have now money to pay a state party? The English is very tricky. Now, the other thing that we need to take into account is the following. Namibia will never be built by foreign nations. They can invest millions. They are not the builder of our nation. The people who are falling hard on the block, those are the people who are going to build Namibia. This is why our association, the Black Business Leadership Network of Namibia, went public on the 20th of November to make sure that policy is reviewed, to make sure that we safeguard the interest and in economic participation of our people. We have all the laws and instruments, but the reality on the ground is different. And this is why I'm saying English is very tricky. They sound so polite, they even sound polite when they say, I'll kill you, you know? We cannot accept such practice in the new republic. And if a person cannot afford a lawyer, do you want to tell me they cannot enter court and defend their position just because they don't have a lawyer? If the same person has money to pay for a lawyer, let that money go to the debt he owes. And if not so, grant the sovereignty to that individual to stand in any court in Namibia and defend their position. But what I have learned over years, the moment you enter the court alone, it's like a chicken among coyotes. You know what is coyotes? Yakalse. Elechanyu tirmekashkia. And then you'll be demoralized, you lower your head and you walk out humiliated. When I hear my brother here narrating his scenario, for the very first time we have drawn banks to be scrutinized and evaluated in their proceedings. Your, your scenario is a reality. That's why our association exists. And it's good that you came today because when we say these things in public, they say we are lying. Honorable Minister, uh, the brother in the camera here is trying to put English together. And what he's saying, if the Ministry of Justice has power, can it be exercised? That it, it's felt relevant? That it shows power and sovereignty to the people the instruments are supposed to lead? Bank of Namibia, if it, if it has power, why does it just come out and say, yeah, the repo rate has increased? Do you think it's a good news to tell the public that the repo rate has increased? What can you do about what you are telling? You are telling us your livelihood is becoming expensive. And then what? So if Bank of Namibia has real power, they must show us. They must show us. It's cheaper living in South Africa with a bigger population, but it's so expensive living in Namibia with a population of 2.5 million. Let us, let, let the instrument of law in this country be beneficial to the people it tends to lead. Somebody spoke the manifesto of our ruling party. It is clear, it's in, in favor of the public, but the address is that it's not what we are experiencing. Let us join hands as members of the public and homeowners so that we address our plight in unison. Uh, color is just a uh, coat. You know, some of you guys look better in the color you are. You know, I love myself chocolate brown. I rest my face. You have bravely stood up 
<coughs> stated your case uh, without fear uh, or favor. And, and that really is, is the intention of public consultations. It's to allow people to speak their mind freely. We will tell you data is the new oil. And, and I'm really happy about uh, some of the work that is going on at the moment with various organizations, doing research, uh, finding out information, also calling us to action. I think the very first speaker, Mr. Summers, uh, and, and Mr. Simon were asking us to do research. Just have a look at um, you know, how many people have lost homes over the past 10 years and what is the profile of people uh, that has lost homes. You know, those are some of the things that we need to be talking about. So thank you mm. for, for coming out and, and bravely standing up and, and putting yourselves out there, basically, uh, and, and saying that, you know, I have lost a home, I have lost a livelihood, you know, I'm no longer the same person that I was. In the presence of some people that are legal practitioners, I know Leticia Hesselman is a legal practitioner, actually, uh, and, and now works with the bank, and it's, it's, it's a dual role that you play. There's a huge problem uh, that even my office is encountering of complaints about the conduct of, of legal practitioners, and it's starting to call into question uh, the nobility of the legal profession. And I think that's an unfortunate position that we find ourselves as legal practitioners, that people no longer trust us, people think of legal practitioners as being in cahoots even to, to people, to impoverish <coughs> uh, some of our citizens. And I think that kind of description is not what I imagined uh, the legal profession would be when I was studying law uh, many, many years ago. So that's something that we will have to, and I, and I take and make a commitment that through their various organizations, the Law Society, the Namibian Lawyers Association, and the Namibian Women's Lawyers Association, we intend to uh, call out and discuss with legal practitioners some of the cons concerns that have particularly been raised around debt collection and the manner in which they're doing it, uh, and also their role in the execution process um, and in the court processes that are associated with people losing their homes. So that's certainly something that we commit to as the Minister of Justice um, because, you know, you know, it is our responsibility within that uh, sphere uh, to raise these concerns that members of the public have raised with us with them. The, the other issue, and I think there are many, many issues, there are many layers to this particular discussion. Some of it, um, John has raised from an academic scholarly perspective, Many of it has also been raised from the lived experiences of people. What are some of the structural challenges that we have um, as a group? You know, post-apartheid, uh, before apartheid, and what is the impact, particularly of legislation that exists in a country that is dating back many, many years? And, and I must tell you, uh, apart from the fact that lawmaking generally is, is a slow, in-depth uh, process, you know, it can also be fast-tracked if members of the public uh, do their part and, and highlight, like you've done today, you know, what are some of those laws that you think? Because we have, we have uh, repealed uh, over 140 laws in 2018. We are currently in the process of, of uh, you know, going through the lawmaking process to repeal another set of, law, of, of laws that we think, you know, and that we know are outdated and no longer consistent with the values and aspirations of the Namibian constitution. Uh, so, so that process is happening and I'm sure through the Law Reform and Development Commission, we intend to have another phase of, of uh, law reform of obsolete and outdated law. So that's an ongoing process. You know, any jurisdiction in the world, some of the oldest jurisdictions will tell you that law review, law, law reform is a process that is ongoing. And it is our responsibility, you know, once we start doing the research, you know, for instance, like the uh, black business people are doing now, 
it is it's, it's, it's really on you, you also to say, we have identified the set of laws um, that will hamper uh, business activity and will prejudice certain groups in a particular fashion. You bring that to our attention, you know, that we continue to use. What we need to be conscious about is what kind of structural impact laws have on the lives that we want to live. And that should be your basis. It shouldn't just be that, you know, oh, this law is from 1946 or this law is from 1974, uh, and therefore, automatically, uh, it is of no value to us. We need to assess the value uh, that a particular piece of legislation has to us. I agree with the principle, and it's always been our position, is that anything that is no longer uh, consistent with the spirit of the Namibian constitution should have no place in our society. But it really takes collective effort for us to make sure that many of those laws uh, should not have any place in our society. So law is one thing. Then there's of course also institutional arrangements that plays a huge, huge role um, in the manner in which things are done in our country. And we recognize uh, that there's, there is probably more that, that should be done, certainly, but there is more that we could have done in the period of time uh, that we have been independent. And that's why we are working at an accelerated pace, at least as the executive, uh, working at an accelerated pace to see how we can improve um, the conditions of our people. Just the, the, the Ministry of Justice uh, started these consultations because we, we were responsible for um, administering certain pieces of legislation, the High Court and the Magistrates Court ones. And it was, it, and these consultations were really born from, from the amendments that we had tabled. So whilst I agree that maybe we should have started at, at right at the top and not have this kind of uh, kind of knee-jerk reaction to, to what has transpired in the National Assembly and subsequently um, is because we saw a real need, that there was need for us to really interrogate. We can no longer, because I think, I'm sure, you know, we've heard this before, where people complain about banks or financial institutions and so forth. You know, some of us also have, you know, in one or the other way have been victims. Um, of various practices of financial institutions, you know, but at that particular time, it may not be something um, that is, you know, uh, maybe a, a priority depending on what the particular national agenda is um, of the executive and of the legislature. We may not have seen the need at the time. But I think when this issue was raised and we sat down as the Ministry of Justice and actually looked at the text of the law, we looked at the various processes, we, we, we said to ourselves, we don't know what the internal processes at banks are, for instance. Um, why don't we find out? What do they do when people default? You know, apart from your personal experiences that you have uh, with banks, it's not the same. When you actually sit down with banks and say to them, but you, you know, there's something that you can do differently here. You know, there's something that we can do differently here. We can increase uh, public awareness, uh, for instance. We can have banks, you know, and I was just reminded, you know, for example, before banks give out loans, you know, do they have discussions with the uh, customer about the possibility of taking out insurance mm -hmm. on a particular loan? You know, what is the extent of that kind of discussion? Uh, for instance, from on the part of banks to say, I mean, actors, things like institutions like actors does it. Mm -hmm. They say, you know, they will call you even if they do so ten times <coughs> to say, just with nine nine Namibian dollar fifty cents, you can get a funeral policy. You can get when you die or you, you go for disability, you know, the your that particular insurance will pay off your loan. So the the questions are. What are the kinds of conversations that happen between <coughs> the bank and the customer at the time um, that they are taking out the loan? And also, when you have a scenario like what appears to be Mr. Kanas' scenario, when a, a customer has been diligent over the years 
uh, paid up, did his best to make sure, and when he's in trouble, he's basically asking us, <coughs> you know, how can you help us? How can you help me when I'm no longer able to, you know, when I'm no longer in a position to pay that we want to have uh, with banks? That's the kind of relationship I imagine, uh, you know, members of the public would like to see. <coughs> And I think Mr. Simon is also raising a very important point, and these are the kinds of conversations that we should continue to have. He's, he's asking, if I'm not able to ask them, why don't you step back, for instance, you know, uh, as a human being firstly, but also as a legal practitioner that sees sense in what is going on. Instead of accumulating with your fees and interest, because that's really, when you really go back to it, you know, your capital amount um, is a certain amount. You know, what gets added is legal fees and interest and so forth. Even, you know, so we were discussing with the banks and with legal practitioners to say, is there a limit to how much you should be charging even? Shouldn't we have a flat rate uh, for, for debt collection uh, for starters? Is there some waiver that can be done? Uh, from banks. I know banks are regulated by the Bank of Namibia, but there isn't a regulation or law if it makes sense for the society in which we live, if it makes sense for us to review it and say what will work for the Namibian society in this instance. And we can introduce, I'm sure, through law reform or regulatory reform, we can introduce something that says after a certain point, um, you know, we, 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 the particular interest can be either waived if you apply for it, and if there's good reason, if there's good cause shown, for instance. Those are some of the proposals, you know, that we were bringing forward to say, let's see how we can assist with mitigating the impact. We are not trying to say that um, people should not pay their debts. They, you have entered into a contract, you have a responsibility, and sometimes that is what, what restricts government <coughs> intervention when the regulatory framework, um, like France was saying, is not friendly enough for us to do that kind of intervention. Government, particularly executive, we don't interfere in court processes. The court is independent and that process is independent. But what we can do, how we can influence court process is through law reform. And, and we were proposing that there should be more power given to the courts than just courts inquiring that this person owes so much, this is how long he has not paid, and therefore, uh, you know, the bank, we are now declaring this particular property as executable. We, we are proposing that there should certainly be more, you know, from, from just from a justice point of view, there should be more that courts can do. But the courts can only do that which is allowed within the ambit of the law, and, and, and this is part of the reason why we're having these consultations. So as I'm concluding, I just want to say some of the other challenges that we have, and I'm talking to the economists and the bankers in the house, um, is the question around um, the growing of the economy, you know, and, and banks, uh, from the statistics that have been shared with us, uh, play a huge, they have a huge input, you know, over 40 billion, if I don't have my numbers correctly, uh, if I have my numbers correctly, over 40 billion input into the GDP of our economy. Then we have the other challenge, and I know what Simon is saying about you cannot um, do your development activities with investors necessarily. It's not their primary concern, you know. Uh, but how how do we balance the competing interest, you know, of attracting uh, investment? making sure that we grow the economy so that we create more employment uh, for our people so that we have more and more people being able to afford uh, land, being able to afford a primary home for their families but also for generations to, to come. So there's certainly uh, a role that I think particularly business people can play in uh, dealing and responding to those concerns that the financial sector has, you know, because what we don't want to create the impression that um, these consultations therefore mean that we are encouraging people 
uh, not to take accountability for their part in because it's not everyone uh, that is in Mr. Kanasib's position. You know, there is also instances where uh, you know some of us are reckless in the manner in which we manage our debt. You know, maybe also reckless in in the manner we handle ourselves. But I think for the majority of the people, it is not recklessness. It is a structural problem. It is the kind of background that you come from uh, that has an impact. You know, when you are the the sole breadwinner, as a lot of Namibia did not give him the assistance that he required, he was desperate. He didn't know where to go. And it's, it really is a responsibility of public institutions uh, to, to provide that kind of information and guidance uh, to, to the Namibian citizen about where they can go when they are destitute and, and desperate. The left experiences of many Namibians, including those that share their stories on this platform today, um, is an indication uh, that what we are doing probably is not enough. You know, we certainly need to do more to protect our citizens. And if that requires a bit of law reform um, with, with, with a, a balanced um, view, you know, and, and we must remember that it, it will not always be everybody. We will not satisfy everyone. But what we need to look at is how the majority of the people are disproportionately affected by some of the decisions that we take, but also by some of the laws that we have in place at the moment. So, um, just to say that there are some amendments that relate to deputy sheriffs and their conduct, you know, that, that is part of the amendments that we are working on. But following these consultations, and we're planning to have a few more uh, before we actually, uh, hopefully in the second session, retable uh, these two pieces of legislation and we hope that the lived experiences but also the voices uh, of the people will come through in the amendments that we see and not just the people I mean the banks have made and have actually agreed on some of our proposals because not only are they cosmetic you know but they also alter how banks will interact with their uh, customers in a substantial type of way. And we've seen some forthcoming uh, you know, views, you know, and very progressive views uh, from, for instance, the Bankers Association of Namibia, which represents the majority of banks. So I'm hoping that after this conversation, we can go back to, to financial institutions and say, this is what the people are saying. What is your response to that? Uh, I, I cannot respond to everything. I think some of it, the legal aid questions, so for those are ongoing conversations. But we certainly hope that you know this is another opportunity for us as leaders uh, to have heard what the people have said, and that this will certainly not. Uh, we, we certainly hope that we are not creating um, an, an undue expectation of what we will achieve with this. But we certainly hope that in the small steps that we are taking, you know, to hear the voice of the people and that that voice will be reflected in, in the laws that we're making and the amendments that we're proposing. Thank you very much.